Hello and welcome to Gospel Foundations, where today we'll be taking a look at God's enduring hope. My name is Leslie Carroll, and it's my privilege to facilitate our study as God leads our look into the storyline of Scripture through the reality of who He is. If you'd like to know any more information about this study or any of our studies, you can find information on LifeWay.com. God keeps His promises. He kept them to Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and to the nation of Israel. For centuries, God was faithful to bless those who blessed His people and to curse those who cursed them. But He was also faithful to His promise to execute judgment on His people as a result of their idolatry. The once great people of God were conquered, and then they were deported, now strangers in a foreign land. The people must have wondered if God had abandoned them. Were all His promises now void? But even in Israel's darkest hour, God wanted them to live with a sense of hope for the future. Though they were exiles, God had not abandoned His plan for them and for the world. In fact, this exile paved the way for God's message about true, enduring hope in the future. God would initiate a new covenant with His people, one in which His law would be written on their hearts. What do you think it means to have God's law written on our heart? Oh, I believe it means that we have a desire to obey God's law, that God's law has become a part of who we are and how we see the world, that we will share a close and personal relationship with the God of the law. Well, let's set the context for our study. The days were dark for the people of God. The northern kingdom of Israel had fallen to the Assyrians, and the Babylonians had conquered the southern kingdom of Judah. The land God promised to Abraham and his descendants had been taken over by foreign armies, and many of the surviving Israelites had been taken into captivity. Well, let me ask, how might circumstances like this influence the way that we thought about hope for the future? Well, perhaps captivity and exile would have killed any thought we had for hope in the future. On the other hand, perhaps these circumstances might have forced us to look for reasons to hope in the future. Exile might have felt like abandonment by God, which leads to no hope for the future. Prior to their exile, God raised up a prophet, Isaiah, to warn Judah and Jerusalem to repent. He spoke about their coming destruction, making sure his prophecies to the, the, the people understood that the pagan kings would be instruments of God's judgment, even though they had no knowledge or no awareness or no appreciation of the God of Israel. But even in these warnings, the book of Isaiah becomes some of the most vivid messages of hope in all of Scripture, messages regarding the Messiah, God's chosen deliverer. Another prophet, Jeremiah, also warned the people to return to God. Jeremiah bore witness to the destruction of Jerusalem, but his prophecies also told of a hope and a future that God had planned for his people, the new covenant. But with both Isaiah and Jeremiah, the deliverance and salvation of the people was something different than they expected. Their deliverer would not be political, but he would be spiritual, and their salvation would be a risk rescue from slavery to sin and death. Well, let's take a brief look at the covenants in Scripture, their recipients, commands, and promises and conditions to see them leading to this new covenant. First, the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapters 12, 15, and 17, a permanent covenant. The recipients, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their descendants. The commands, keep the covenant, circumcise every male. The promises and conditions, land, offspring, and blessing. Next, the Mosaic covenant, the old covenant, Exodus chapters 19 through 24. The recipients, the people of Israel. The commands, keep the covenant and obey the law. The promises and conditions, blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. Then the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel and Psalm 89, a permanent covenant. 
the recipients David and his descendants, the commands, keep the covenant and obey the law, promises and conditions, a great name, stability for God's people with an eternal house, kingdom, and throne. And then the new covenant, Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 and 37, a permanent covenant. The recipients, the believers in the Messiah, the commands, keep the covenant, repentance, and faith. The promises and conditions, a new heart, indwelt by God's Holy Spirit, cleansing and forgiveness of sins, and a Davidic king forever. Each of these covenants points to Jesus Christ as its fulfillment. Jesus is the blessing and the offspring of Abraham. Jesus is the son of David on the eternal throne. And Jesus is the sacrifice that inaugurates the new covenant. Jesus perfectly obeys the commands of the Mosaic Covenant while simultaneously taking upon himself the curse for our disobedience. This is the hope that the whole world needs to hear. God's people had God's law but were still unable to obey him due to sinfulness of their hearts. Isaiah and Jeremiah prophesied about a coming day when God would forgive his people's sins and write his law on their hearts. These prophecies point to God's provision of Jesus. Through Jesus, God offers us forgiveness, and through the Holy Spirit, God enables us to obey His commands. Now, let's take a look into Scripture at God providing a suffering servant for His people. We'll be in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 4 through 12, and they read, as follows. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied." By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Oh, what are some of the ways that we see the life and death of Jesus foreshadowed in this prophecy in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament? I believe we see that Jesus was pierced for our rebellion. Jesus was silent before his accusers. Jesus was crucified as a criminal and buried in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man. The people must have wondered if there was any hope at all. They were beaten dejected, and enslaved. And yet, they could still call to mind the prophecies from Isaiah who, though he had warned them of God's coming judgment, also pointed to a future day of God's restoration and deliverance. This restoration would come from the Messiah, God's anointed one. And one of the most vivid descriptions of the Messiah is found in these verses. Well, let's put ourselves in the time of Isaiah's prophecy, listening to these words. Imagine our anticipation of a coming Messiah who would set captives free. What kind of Messiah would we expect? 
Oh, maybe the promised one will stand 10 feet tall, weighing in at 450 pounds of solid muscle, the heavyweight champion of the world. With one swing of his sword, he could chop down a hundred men, take back all that had been stolen from Israel, and reign forevermore. That's what we might expect, and it seems that that is how the prophecy begins in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, which says, The servant will be high and lifted up and exalted. Oh, but then, instead of hearing words like king, power, and conquer, we hear words like grief, sorrow, stricken, and afflicted. We start to understand that this servant servant will be humbled before he is exalted, rejected before he is accepted. In the midst of prophesied enslavement, during the uncertainty, suffering, and oppression of God's people, the Messiah is promised. But instead of a heavyweight champion of the world that we all wanted, we got a disfigured, suffering servant, and we were repulsed by him. What made this servant so repulsive to us? He bore our griefs and carried sorrows. He was stricken, afflicted, pierced, and crushed. We were nauseated at the sight of a Savior who had wounds, because after all, conquerors are not supposed to be wounded. They are the ones that are supposed to be wounding others. But our repulsion runs even deeper than that. This Messiah didn't just bear any griefs and carry any sorrows. He carried ours. We are placed in a position we don't want to be in, forced to confront our sinfulness and need of a Savior. In this passage, we see God's desired outcome, which is salvation for His people, and the way it is accomplished the death of a servant. The victory of God is demonstrated in the righteous servant justifying sinners. The beauty of a holy and loving God is on full display in the cross of Jesus Christ. In this mysterious prophecy, we see a glimpse of Jesus accomplishing the victory of salvation through suffering. At the cross, God fully demonstrated His justice. Holding nothing back, He poured out His full wrath against our sin. At the cross, He fully demonstrated His mercy by sending His Son to die in our place to take the punishment we deserve. Isaiah shared this prophecy approximately 700 years before the birth of Christ. In this, we are reminded that the coming of Christ to die and be raised again was not an afterthought to God. Rather, the gospel has been the centerpiece of God's plan all along. These verses show us that though Israel might have been looking for a political Savior, God would provide them the greater Savior that they truly needed. Now let's look further into Scripture at God restoring the land of His people in the book of Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 8 through 14 and they read as follows. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble. Because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Hear the word of the Lord, you nations. Proclaim it in different coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. For the Lord will deliver Jacob and redeem them from the land of those stronger than they. They will come and shout for the joy of the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord, the grain, the new wine, and the olive oil, the young of the flocks and the herds. They will be like well-watered garden, and they will sorrow no more. Then young women will dance and be glad, and young men and old as well. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. I will satisfy the priests with abundance, and my people will be filled with my bounty, declares the Lord. Oh, why might this prophecy have been so encouraging to God's people when they were in exile? It showed that God still claimed His people as His own. It spoke of God's comfort for His people in bringing them back to their land. And the prophecy promised to turn their mourning into joy as God provided all for all their needs. 
God's people were in exile. The land God had promised to their forefathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was now in the hands of the nations. The best and the brightest of the Hebrews had been taken away from their homes. But God had not forgotten his promise to Abraham so many years ago. He would bring his people back, but it would not be immediate. If we were to read the rest of the book of Jeremiah, we would find that God intended to leave his people in captivity for 70 years. It would be long enough that he told them through his prophets to marry, to work, and to seek the good of the land that they were living in. All the while, God knew that eventually he would provide a way for the people to return from their exile. This would have given them great hope, given great hope to the Israelites who found themselves in faraway lands. But it also gives us great hope today. Well, how's that? Well, it gives us hope because it reminds us that the promises of God are true and they are lasting because God is bound by his own character to keep his word. Consider the great promise that Paul would later record for the followers of Jesus in the New Testament in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. And they read, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why can nothing separate us from the love of God? It's not because we're holy, righteous, obedient, or even very lovable in and of ourselves. But it is because God's promise to never leave us or forsake us is rooted in himself, in his character, in his strength, and in his commitment, and thank goodness it is. God would return the people to the land, not because they deserved it, but because he promised that the land was theirs, and God always keeps his promises. The people's return to the land also gives us hope because it reminds us that God does truly care for the here and now. One might argue that the issue of land was of little importance to God because he only deals in matters of eternity. Sometimes we might slip into thinking that God pays little attention to our present circumstances. But our Father in heaven cares about things like our jobs, our homes, and our worries. He cares about today and he cares about tomorrow. We can then confidently cast our cares on him because he cares for us. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 7. Finally, the people's return to the land gives us hope because it reminds us that all who believe in Jesus have another land to go home to. In a sense, we are all strangers and aliens. When we put our trust in Jesus, we are adopted into God's family, and as such, we have a new home with Him. This world as it is now, even our bodies as they are now, are only temporary dwellings in which we reside, but our true home is elsewhere, the new heavens and the new earth. As we read the description of what it would be like when the exiles were allowed to return to their land, we get but a shadow of what it will be like when all of us who are in Christ get to go to our true home. With unimaginable and inexpressible joy, we will all one day enter into our true home and our Father will be there with open arms to welcome us. One day, all will be as it was always meant. To be. Now, let's read further in the scripture about God changing the hearts of his people in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And they read as follows. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. 
I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Where do we see the gospel in this prophecy? Oh, we see that God will change the hearts of his people with his teachings. This new covenant will be accomplished completely by God. The new covenant will deal fully and finally with the problem of sin. Jeremiah's message to the God's people was good news, but it was not the news that they wanted to hear. No doubt the people in Jeremiah's day wanted to hear a message about outward prosperity, of peace with the warring nations around them, of stability in their lives. Though the people perceived that their greatest threat was from their conquerors, Jeremiah revealed that what they really had to fear was far closer than that. It was the sin that was within their own hearts. Jeremiah's message from the Lord might not have met the people's expectations in terms of the physical, but it cut straight to the heart of the matter. Because our problem is far worse than we dare to imagine, the message is but much better than we could have dreamed. This is the promise of the new covenant. But just because it's new to us does not mean it's a brand new idea in the heart of God. Sometimes we may have the tendency to think that God's plan A was the Garden of Eden, but once the first humans willfully chose to sin against him, God had to go back to the drawing board. And in this scenario, the new covenant, the gospel, came one day as God had the brilliant idea of sending Jesus into the world as if Jesus were plan B. Oh, no, 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 this is not true. If it were true, it would mean that God is on some kind of progressive learning curve and that he made an error in judgment at the very beginning and then was forced to scramble to make up for lack of his foresight. Oh, no, no, no. We know that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection has always been the centerpiece of history. 1 Peter in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, tells us this. And I quote, He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. He was chosen before the creation of the world. God's plan was not new to God, but it was new to the people. For generations, the people had a history of trying and failing, trying and failing, never able to live up to the written code of the old covenant of God. God was merciful time and time again, pursuing them to bring, back, to bring them back to himself. But even so, the old covenant only imposed the law. It did nothing to empower the people to keep it. But here, in the new covenant, not only would God provide the knowledge of his will, but he would also write it within the new hearts of his people. The law was moving from the external to the internal. Many people think of believing the gospel as a choice uh, between going to heaven or going to hell. And they know they don't want to go to hell, so they choose, in, uh, to, choose to trust in Christ and to be saved um, so that they will live eternally in heaven instead. Well, while it's true that trusting in Christ for forgiveness and righteousness is indeed the only way to God, if that's all we think about when we think of the gospel, then we're falling far short of its implications. The gospel is the message that because our hearts are so corrupted in sin, by sin, that we need a new heart that is turned toward God. We need a change within us. And that's why this new covenant takes place where it does. It's not written on tablets or parchment, but it's written on our new hearts. When we believe the message of the gospel, the old person that we once were dies and we are spiritually resurrected with Christ. This new covenant 
meets us at our deepest need, a heart engraved by sin and with sin. It promises a new heart that is indwelt by God. And this new covenant gives us the amazing privilege of living in fellowship with our Creator. The new covenant includes the privilege of a heart that truly knows God. Because we have been forgiven and have been given new hearts, we rely on the Holy Spirit as we obey God's commands and live on mission to make His kingdom known to all the world. Let's carry out our mission and with our new hearts today. Be on mission for the Lord and with the Lord with our new hearts today. Oh, I hope you've enjoyed looking at God's enduring hope and have been encouraged. I have, and I'm so glad that you've joined me. There will be a contact slide that will come up shortly, and I'd love to hear from you with any questions, comments, or anything that you'd like to share. And I hope you will join me next time when we will be looking at God's continued strength. Oh, don't miss it. Until then, God bless you and keep you.